I was sitting thinking this morning a bit about um, Lifehouse and our significance in East London. I believe that God has got a plan with this church in our city. Now, the plan equals you. Okay, they didn't catch that. Misschien moet ek het, moet ek het in Afrikaans sê. Ek, oe, is een paar Afrikaanse mensies. Ek glo die Heere het een plan met Lifehouse Kerk in West Londen. En die Heere se plan is gelijk aan jy. Jou. Wat? Jy. Jou. Uh, jylle. Jylle. I don't know if you caught that. I want you to just pause and think with me for a moment. The impact of a church is not bound to a building. Hallelujah. The impact of the church is bound upon our hearts, upon our lives. You and I, these people that said we are part of Lifehouse Church, that is the impact in our city, your life, your hands, your words. So Lifehouse Church, even those of you online, wherever you are, Lifehouse Church has significance in the city based upon your life. The church is not a place where we sign up to membership and we claim a seat in the church and we keep it nice and warm every Sunday. No, the church is when you wake up Monday morning and you start your car and you get to your job and it's crazy there and the mensen vloek hard and they lieg hard and they steal your zombies out of the fridge. That's where the church matters. When someone's sitting there lunchtime and they're crying their eyes out that you don't ignore them, you go and you sit and say, hey, what's up? Do you want to talk about it? I'm here for you. That's the church. When someone's sitting there at the till at spa and they're counting out their pennies and they just don't have enough to pay and they take one of those items and they put it aside and you walk past three trolleys and you say, excuse me, sorry. Put that back. Let me pay for it. The Lord loves you. He sees you today. That's the church. Okay, well, I thought that was kind of cool. It's like, I, 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 I don't know. I planned two months to say that. And I was, I, I, I imagined people going, yeah, let's do it. Uh. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's cool. That one was free, by the way. <laughs> I, um... I'm starting a four-part series today. It's called Your Life Story Matters. Your Life Story Matters. This is part one today, which I would like to share with you. And I'm starting this morning's service with a question. You know, I think that we've become so quick to form opinions about people. I think in our current day and age, it's so easy to look at somebody and cast some form of judgment based on what we see or what we hear. Am I right? And so I want to ask you a question. Have you ever, <laughs> let's go deep from the beginning. Have you ever judged some? No, I'm sure we all have. But have you ever judged someone only to find out later that you were wrong? You see, we, I've heard a lot of yeses here. What we don't recognize is that we do it actually more often than not. More often than what we're willing to admit. You see, you said yes because you remembered a story in your life of a real significant moment where you judged someone and realized later on, oh my word, my judgment was wrong. So, I want to speak to you about the heart. I want to read a scripture for you this morning. We know the scripture well. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says the following. It says, the human heart is the most deceitful. What said I did? Of all things. 
And it is what? Sorry, what is desperately wicked? The heart. Then he goes on to say, who really knows how bad it is? Now, how many of you haven't been told or how many of you haven't told somebody else, follow your heart? When we know that the most deceitful of all things is the heart. Hello? That's enough. Because this thing is strong. And the feelings we feel here is strong. Someone op your toe and trap, you smile nie for her Someone scratches your car, you don't say, ach, do it on the other side as well. You know, it's, this is strong. So we know that we actually can't just trust what we feel and that our heart can lie to us about situations, especially people. And I want to tell you something. I judged people and got it wrong. And I want to tell you a part of my story today, if that's okay. You might have noticed that for a while I've been using the word legacy. Building legacy. Legacy. What is life without legacy? You guys with me? And I want to tell you why the word legacy has come to me. Both my parents have passed away already. Um, And so that made me really just think a lot about legacy and where's the legacy. And so when I think about my family my mom and my dad, and the life that we lived. I I won't lie to you, the memories of my family is showered with pain and hurt and rejection and suffering and just despair. It's just a horrible memory, okay? And um, so I don't think about my mom and my dad as this awesome legacy story, I just have a lot of bad memories. And so I've, I've also mentioned this here that I don't want my life to just merely be a memory. I want it to be a legacy. Hello? So just briefly, for those of you who don't know the story, um, just my sister's two years younger than me. And just after she was born, my mother was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And not long after that, she was confined to a wheelchair, and it was just chaos all our life. Um, it was just horrible. My poor mother, she just suffered for so many years to the point, and now I'm skipping like so many years forward, till the point that they had to amputate her legs, and she, she couldn't eat properly. She couldn't sit up. She couldn't see anymore. She could hardly hear. It was just bad. This poor woman's life was just bad. And, and she begged God to die for many years. I'll never forget her praying and crying, God, please just take me from this forsaken life. And I'd sit there and try and comfort her and cry with her. And like, oh, should I pray the same prayer? And I did. You know, like, Lord, this is too bad. Can you please just let her die or something? This is too bad for this poor woman. That's what I encountered with my mom. And she would ask, why am I alive? And she's trapped in this body. I'll never forget. She used to say, I'm so trapped in this body and I can't do anything. And And that's all that I remember. Enslaved to sickness. She was enslaved to suffering. She felt forgotten and completely useless. And as a kid growing up with that, so I remember so clearly that when she died, I was relieved. I was sad, obviously, but I was like, I'll never forget. I stood over her bed. And I looked at her and I said, you finally made it. I was 18 years old and she was 41. Young. When I was 18, I thought she was old. (laughs) You made it. What a sad life story, huh? Sucks, right? I don't know about you, but I want more for my life. Sad, eh? Two weeks ago, I got a phone call from my uncle. My mom was one of five children. 
five kids. And my uncle is the youngest of the five children. And uh, my uncle, for those of you that do not know, has been my spiritual father, my mentor, and has groomed me for ministry into who I am today, by the way. Um, so we have a very, very long history. But he phoned me and he said to me, Lee, I want to just, I've been reflecting on my life and I've been reflecting on some of the significant moments in my life and I want to just tell you the story. And I was like, hey, yeah, tell me, I'm listening. And he said to me, he was just under a year old and he waddled out of the house and fell into their pool. Under a year old, fell into their pool, to the bottom of the pool, drowning. My mom realized he wasn't in, ran searching, saw him at the bottom of the pool, and dived him out of the bottom of the pool and saved his life. One year old toddler. I was like, wow, that's, that's power. He said to me, when he went to grade one, there was no preschool. There was no preschool. So when he went to grade one, he was stoxy and little okay. He was so scared. He, had, he was crying his eyes out. No one was there. And my mom would come and she would comfort him. She would sit with him before school. She would sit with him every break time and walk him home. My mom was there. I was like, I never knew that. He said, yeah. He said, when I came out of the army... When he came out of the army, he was disillusioned. He was all over South Africa. He was a mess, he said. He said, your mom opened her house and said, come and live with us. Gave him the outside room. And, and I was like, oh, I can actually remember that as a little boy, that you came and lived in our outside room. He said, yeah, your mom gave me a place to stay. He said, you know what happened? Is she introduced me to someone who gave me my first job. My mom. And then that's, that's not the end of the story. He said, what happened then is she took me to church in Valco. She took me to church, and that's where I met my wife. I was like, wow, that's where he met my aunt. And from there, he stepped into the ministry. And he said to me, oh, I just wanted you to know that, you know, your mom actually had some serious impact in his life and everything. And, and that's where his ministry took off. And I was like, I never knew that. And I realized something. If she never did those things, I wouldn't be standing here today. Lifehouse Church would not exist. You wouldn't be here today. If my mom didn't jump into the pool, say the little one-year-old's toddler's life, sit with him at break time, give him a place to stay after the army, took him to church. Can you see something that I didn't see before? I realized something. I misjudged my mother's story. My judgment was off. You know why? Because I only knew a part of her story. The painful part of my short life as a, as a child in her life. However, her legacy lives on. Oh my word. She is not merely just a memory. There's more to the story. Are you guys okay? I want to give you a quote. This quote is very powerful. If you can put it on the screen for me, D. This quote comes from my wife, eh? She doesn't know that I'm using her quote today. That's why I didn't ask her because she would have said no. But I felt it so important today. I want you to listen to this. Never judge someone based upon a single page of their life story. Too many of us look at people and we judge them based on one moment or an experience that we have or a story that we know and we've cast complete judgment over their life story. It's so wrong. I cast judgment over my own mother's life 
for a number of years. I thought I had the full picture. I had nothing of the full picture. I was wrong. And too many of us do this. We judge someone based on a single page that we read out of their lives, an encounter that we have in their lives. And we often, you know what we do? We disqualify people. I disqualified my mom's legacy. You might have disqualified somebody and say, I never want to see that person or even speak to them again. You might disqualify them and say they're lower than you. Or whatever. Or they don't, or they don't deserve your forgiveness. Are you seeing where I'm going? So I thought that was a powerful quote. Thanks, love. <laughs> I want to take you to the Bible quickly. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to the book of Joshua, chapter 2. Joshua, chapter 2, and I'm going to read for you. Sure, man. A story, if I may, just a short one. You guys still all right? Your life story matters. Joshua 2, verse 1. Just listen to this quickly. He says here, Then Joshua secretly sent out two spies from the Israelite camp at Acacia Grove. He instructed them, scout out the land on the other side of the Jordan River, especially the city of Jericho. So he sent, you guys know about the spies that were sent to, to check out Jericho, right? So the two men sent out, um, which set out and came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab, and they stayed there that night. Mmm, a bit sketchy, doesn't it sound a bit sketchy. Israelite spies going to a prostitute's house. But yeah, I want to just, abbre I'm going to abbreviate the story. So this woman, obviously her house is open for anyone, ne? I mean, like, there's no locks on her door, right? Okay, so the Israelites go and, and they walk into Rahab's house and they're there to scout out Jericho. Some of the men in Jericho notice these two men. They notice the Israelites. They go to the Jericho king. They say to the king, Israel sent spies there at Rahab's house. They had to spy out Jericho. You guys know the story. So he sends his army and they end up there and Rahab says, there's nobody here. She hides the men away. She turns to them and she says to the men of Israel, I know that your God, I know that your God has given us into your hands. This is a prostitute speaking, eh? Because the Bible says there, I underlined it. Prostitute, prostitute, Rahab. Simple, it's there, it's labeled. Nice. She lowers them down outside the window. We know the, how the story ends. Israel eventually comes. They walk around Jericho. The walls of Jericho fall. It's a victory. It's an incredible victory. What a story. Uncle, just say, say something, please. I'm working here. I'm working here and I don't hear anything. Please, just say amen, please. Thank you. Love it. Love it. <laughs> I, just need, I, need, I haven't been here for a while. I said to Elsie, I'm nervous to preach. And now everybody's so quiet, man. Is it okay? Is it okay? Oh, just checking. So, <laughs> I, want, I want to say something. I'm going to make a statement that I think is important. And I'm, going to, I'm, and I'm going to echo why I say that. I believe that God led them to go to her house. That's helpful to say. To a prostitute's house. I'll tell you why. Because she was the only one in Jericho who believed in God. Now, if I introduce you to Rahab the prostitute, she walks in here on Sunday morning. I say, oh, this is prostitute Rahab. Are you going to say to her, come and sit next to me? But let's get real. Let's, let's get real about the way that we cast judgment on one page of somebody's story. Check what this chick did. Anyway, I just thought that was really cool. But, but Yaz is scary about her story. If you go all 
the way into the New Testament. Now, now that, that's not a very nice title, but I think they had no other way to introduce her, right? Okay, so check this out. If we go to Hebrews 11, verse 31. Yeah, this is a powerful scripture. It says, it was by faith that what? Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had given a friendly welcome. Welcome. I think she was obviously friendly. Like, come to my house, you know? So I, I, she, no, it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that. I don't know. I wasn't there. Maybe it started out friendly. And then the power of God stepped in. Now, I was, when I read this, I was going, oh, shame. What a legacy for Rahab. I mean, all the way into the book of Hebrews, couldn't they have written it like this? It was by faith that Rahab, the hero of Israel, that led to the fall of Jericho's wall. Wouldn't that have been a better title? So they introduce her in Hebrews. This poor chick, she's dead for so many years. And this is how everybody remembers her. Rahab the... Ek frajo, wat is jou legacy? She was a damn bad girl. And we know her as the prostitute Rahab. That's her legacy. It's documented in the Bible for every generation to read. Powerful pages in her life story, right? I mean, that sticks out like a sore thumb, right? Anyway, my sermon's coming to an end. I just thought I should share with you the significance of that. But if you have your Bible, in fact, you should have your Bible. Will you turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 1? We should be done by 6 p.m. tonight. We're going to go through the book of Matthew. We're going to read verse by verse. Now, I know, I just want, I want to read a couple of verses um, Let's start reading verse 1. Are you guys with me? You guys got your Bibles open? Good. Matthew chapter 1. Online. Phones are allowed. Tablets are allowed. Whatever. Just read this with me. And I might mess up a couple of names because there's a million names here. But just hear me. My Bible says the genealogy of Jesus Christ. It says in verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Verse 2 says, Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot Judah and his brothers, Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar, Perez begot Hezron and Hezron begot begot Ram. Are you still with me? Just take a deep breath, okay? Ram, this is the family tree of Jesus, right? Ram begot Amanadab, Amanadab got begot uh, Nashon, uh, Nashon begot Salmon. Uh, it sounds a little bit Italian, eh? All right, all right, all right. And then, and then verse 5, I can speak Italian. <laughs> That's nice, yes. That's, if you get stuck with biblical genealogy, just go Italian, all right. <laughs> and now verse 5 gets slightly interesting. It says, Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse. And Jesse begot, begot David the king. The prostitute Rahab. If you do not read the full story, you would judge her by her title. And miss that she actually is part of the powerful bloodline of the King of Kings. Her story doesn't end with her initial introduction as prostitute. 
And your story doesn't have to end with the introduction of what you've done wrong. Thank you, Lord. Do not judge someone by a single page of their life story. Alzari Crinia. <laughs> I don't know, that just hit me so hard. Some of you didn't know that, right? Who didn't know that? Yeah, that's power, right? You can go and do the study. That is Rahab, the prostitute. It's just, it doesn't make sense. But it's beautiful because it shows the character of God. And I want to read you the next scripture, and I'm almost done. Two scriptures left, and I'm done. Romans 8, 28, another well, well well-known scripture. Listen to the scripture. It says, we know, you can read this out loud with me, that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I want to say to you, you've been called to his purpose. The problem is not the purpose of God upon your life. The problem is the label that you're living under. Some of us need to step out of what we have heard people say or judgments that have been cast over us and step into the purpose of God over our lives. Because his purpose is far greater than the label prostitute. Because he used that prostitute to his glory. That the genealogy came all the way through. He redeemed her because of her faith, people. Not because of what she did wrong. He redeemed her because of her faith. And God wants to redeem you because of your faith. Check this out. It says, we know that in all things, God works. I want to ask you a question today. How much do you trust His word over what people say over you? I pause and swallow what I'm sharing with you today. How valuable is his word in comparison to some other dust human beings that say something about you? Because somebody just says something and we buckle. God says, I've called you. And we go, cool. That should be a thousand times more powerful than what people say. Some of us, in fact, all of us, have got parts in our story that we would rather keep buried. But let me tell you something. God will use every part of your story if you will just allow Him. Because I can promise you now, when we get to heaven and we meet Rahab, We say, Rahab, so good to meet you. Did you know your title was prostitute? She says, yes, I know it was prostitute. It is no longer prostitute. It's now daughter of the Most High. And God has a title over you and over your life that far surpasses human judgment over your life. You just need to step into it by faith. God's not asking for perfection. He's asking you to say, Lord, I recognize, Rahab said to the Israelites, I recognize that your God has given us into, into your hands, so I just submit myself by faith to this. That's what you and I need to do. So I'd like to end off with a scripture. I hope this wasn't too long as an introduction. I mean an introduction sermon. (laughs) But I want to end off with this scripture. It's a scripture that that came to me before my uncle phoned me. I've been thinking about this, thinking about this in this this rest period of mine. And I want to give it to you and I want to put a spin on the scripture that I never had. Thanks, D. You can put it up there. (laughs) Now, I want to read it slowly. You know it and you're brain will naturally just push it aside because you know it but the bible says trust in the lord 
with all of that very thing that deceives you so easily. <laughs> Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek His will in all that you do, and He will show you which path to take. The part that I underlined in my heart is, do not depend on your own understanding. And then I heard the story of my mother, and I realized my understanding is limited. And every day, if I'm humble enough, God can broaden my understanding. Are you with me? But if I lock myself into what I understand and go, okay, this is safe. I'm going to act out of my understanding. I am limiting God in my life. And I'm going to hurt people. Do you, do you catch what I'm saying? I'm going to limit God and I'm going to hurt people. The problem is that pride, the pride of man, and we're going to speak a little bit about that next week. The pride of man is so strong that it naturally leads us to do what? Lean on your own understanding. You know how to drill a hole in a wall, so this is how I drill a hole in the wall. You hammer, hammer in the, I know. So I lean on my, and, and, and Scripture says, trust in the Lord with all of that thing that's so freaking deceitful. How do I do that? I'll show you. It's hard, but this is how. This is a heart posture. This is a heart posture. I don't need to prove to you that I'm anything but I'm going to trust the I'm going to make mistakes and there's going to be a story there's going to be a page in my life story that's going to be so stuffed up and people are going to probably judge me because of that one page but I know that God knows the full story and I know that God's label over me is love scripture says his banner over me is love come on people I want to end off this morning with a question. What is your judgment about yourself? What is it that you say about yourself? I'm not going to answer it for you. I want you to go and think about it. What is it that you are labeling yourself with? Let's pray. My God, I am humbled to be in your house today. I am humbled, Lord, to share a portion of your word today. I pray, Holy Spirit, that this word would work in every one of our hearts, including mine. To the glory of your name. I pray, O oh God, for every seed to be seasoned by your spirit so that it can bear fruit, kingdom fruit in our lives, Lord. For every person that's here, for every person online, Holy Spirit, would you minister to our hearts? Lord, where the enemy loves holding up the banner of prostitute over our hearts, loves lifting up that one page where we failed. Lord, I thank you that your plan and your purpose is far greater than the titles of our past. And that you've called us into your marvelous light. And I pray for every person sitting here today, Lord, to recognize that you have called them into freedom. And that you have a purpose. And may they see it, God. May they see it. May we all see it, Lord. May we step into who you have made us to be, O oh Lord. Thank you, Father, that our life story does matter. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.